And welcome, welcome to this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. This is the official traditional opening of all Commonwealth Club events, and I definitely wanted to have the chance to say it and to share with you that this program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. And as George Dobbin said, my name is Mina Kim. I am the evening anchor for KQED News and the Friday host of Forum. And it is my great pleasure to be able to say a few words about actor, activist, king of the internet, according to Taco Bell, <laughs> as it says on his Twitter bio, George Takei. And of course, as you probably know, George Takei's career, his acting career spans six decades, but he is best known for his role in the original Star Trek TV series as the helmsman of the Starship Enterprise, Hikaru Sulu. And I could, I could recite, actually, the opening to Star Trek, uh, not because I'm a huge fan, I'm sorry, <laughs> but because my oldest brother was, and he was nine years older than me, so he was much bigger and stronger than me, and so what he watched, I watched. And uh, so when I found out that I would have the opportunity to interview George Takei, I immediately reached out to him to brag, of course, <laughs> and then, but, uh, but mainly just to say how cool was it for you? It must have been pretty awesome to see an Asian American on a major TV show who was behaving as an Asian American and not some caricature of an Asian American at that time. And he told me that that really meant a lot, but that it wasn't just about representation. For him, it was what Star Trek was about, which was about the future, and it gave him hope for how Asian Americans would be seen in the future. And so, so much of George Takei's work is about the future, and I'm going to read his very impressive um, achievements for you. He is uh, he is one of the country's leading figures in the fight for social justice, LGBTQ rights, and marriage equality. He's a powerful commentator on politics to pop culture. Mashable.com named him the most influential person on Facebook with more than 10 million likes and nearly 3 million Twitter followers. George Takei even hosts the AARP's YouTube series, Takei's Take on tech and current events. He has a documentary, To Be Takei, on his life and career. And on his own YouTube channel, George and his husband, Brad Takei, bring viewers into their personal lives in the heightened reality web series, It Takei's Two. <laughs> George Takei also recently made his Broadway debut in the musical Allegiance, inspired by his experience in US internment camps. And yes. Allegiance ran in New York in 2015 and 2016 and had its Los Angeles premiere in 2018. And now George Takei has a new graphic memoir titled They Called Us Enemy, where he revisits his childhood experience as, as one of 120,000 Japanese Americans imprisoned by the US government without charges during World War II. He details the forces that shaped him and America itself in this tale of courage, loyalty to country, and love. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, George Takei. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That certainly is an oh my crowd. Yes. A you, San Francisco crowd. There is a lot of love for you here, George Takei. And Sulu was born in San Francisco. You Woo! two Star Trek fans know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you have such, I mean, God, hearing your voice, my gosh. Incredible <laughs> voice. I have to start, of course, with the news of the day which is the news that uh, San Francisco's own House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, has announced her support for an impeachment inquiry of President Trump. You have had 
a lot to say about President Trump <laughs> in the last few years. So give me your reaction to this news, this breaking Well, news. high time. <laughs> it's uh, something that should have happened uh, much, much uh, earlier. But I think um, speak <coughs> Speaker P uh, Pelosi was right in waiting for huh. the uh, events to, to pile up. Uh, the Donald has a habit of being his own adversary. I mean, he creates situations that calls for impeachment and uh, then uh, gets, uh, digs deeper and deeper and, and uh, gets uh, further down into the muck. And so uh, it is timely now that we have uh, this process beginning. Well, can you give us any insight into the Donald, as you called him? Because <laughs> you were on The Apprentice, and you have had conversations with him. And as you just said, I mean, what Democrats are saying is this is largely the result of him admitting that he had a conversation with a leader of Ukraine in which he asked for an investigation into Joe Biden. And so, what is it about the Donald that you think leads him to act this way and feel perfectly comfortable saying, yes, I did, and there's nothing wrong with it? I think uh, deep down inside, he has an inferiority complex. He has had many, many failures in his life. You know, he has a trail of bankruptcies. He's had uh, failures of uh, two marriages. Uh, he has uh, uh, a lot of things to be very insecure about. And uh, so in order to cover up that, he acts tough and bigger and smarter, which he uh, obviously clearly is not. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a, a cover up. I mean, the problems he makes for himself he confesses to, I mean, the, the most recent one, uh, his uh, muscling uh, the uh, president of uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Zelensky, uh, about his help in uh, finding dirt on his potential adversary. I mean, and then he, you know, he in initiates that, and then when he's questioned about it and he's put, uh, put under pressure, he uh, confesses to it. And so that brings on uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, uh, reaction, the, uh, uh, the uh, impeachment inquiry. Well, George Takei, you yourself have had many trials and very difficult experiences in life. You come out very differently than the Donald, but take us back I'd well, like you know, with the Donald, I did his show, uh, uh, The uh, Apprentice, and uh, I uh, used that to get a little bit more personal with him. Uh, at that time, when, I, when we did that show, uh, New York State did not have marriage equality, and uh, he uh, had not taken a position on it. We had a, a press conference where uh, uh, we were uh, the entire cast was uh, promoting, publicizing our show. And near the end of that press conference, I said, Mr. Trump, I'd like to invite you to have, uh, I'd like to host you to uh, lunch at one of your restaurants, if you prefer, to discuss marriage equality. Probably did prefer, yeah. What? He probably did prefer to be at one of his restaurants. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, it took a long time to get to it, but uh, it was in a Trump restaurant. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in Trump Tower. I, I was going to suggest Jean Georges, you know, <laughs> a, a much more expensive place since I was hosting. But uh, he said, no, 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 I'm hosting. But what I wanted to do with that invitation yeah. was to get him on the record. Uh, I thought, you know, if we get him on the record in front of all the press gathered there, that would be a powerful way of uh, using him one way or the other as a uh, target or as an example, mm. uh, whichever way he, he uh, went. 
and I said, I'd like to you know, uh, discuss marriage equality with you. And I fully expected him to demur, saying, uh, you know, I'm too busy, I can't do it. But he surprised me. He said, that, that might be an interesting uh, discussion. So have your people call my people and we'll find a mutually convenient date. It took a long time, about four or maybe five months. But finally we found a date and uh, we met at, he said, let's meet at Trump Tower. I, uh, and he came down the escalator. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I'm gonna host you, George. And I said, oh, well, I was gonna suggest we take a cab to Jean George. He says, no, no, I'll host you right here. We went to the Trump Grill in the basement of the Trump Tower, <laughs> much cheaper than Jean George. <laughs> and uh, I said, um, you know, why don't you support marriage equality? Because you're a businessman, it'll be profitable for you. Uh, LGBT people would love to get married in New York, uh, New York City. They'll, they'll come from all over the country. They'll stay in your hotel, they'll eat in your restaurants. Uh, they, some may even get married in one of your uh, banquet halls. So, you know, you'll, you'll profit as a businessman. Why don't you support marriage equality? He said, well, no, I, um, I believe in traditional marriage. <laughs> he had been married three times, famously unfaithful through all three marriages, and he said he believes in traditional marriage. I said to him, you know, yes, I believe in traditional marriage too. Traditional marriage is where two people who love each other deeply commit to each other through thick and thin, in sickness or in health, as they say in the uh, uh, vows, and particularly in sickness because, uh, you know, if uh, LGBT people uh, should go to the hospital for one reason the, uh, or the other, the partner will not be able to visit uh, him or her because of the uh, uh, lack of uh, a married, a legal relationship. And that's very unfair to uh, 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 people who love each other. So I believe in people who commit to each other, thick or thin, until for life. Yes. I mean, that's traditional marriage. George Takei. You really know how to tell a story, but also how to make sure there is a message and that that message doesn't get lost. And that's one of the things that I really responded to as you were telling the story of your imprisonment in U.S. internment camps. And I was wondering, <coughs> using your storytelling prowess, if you could take us back to that night when you were four years old and the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, came for you and your family. Well, actually, I had just turned five years old. Uh, my birthday is April 20th, 1937. Uh, I might note that uh, I'm one month older than the landmark Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand this theater was built in 1937. So I'm the same age as this theater and a month older than the Golden Gate Bridge. And both are icons <laughs> and holding up extremely well. <laughs> and um, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed when I was four years old. Yes. But right. on April 20th, I turned five. And it was about three or four weeks after that that my parents got me up very early in the morning and dress, uh, together with my brother, who was a year younger, and my baby sister, who was an infant, they dressed us hurriedly, and my brother and I were told to wait in the living room while our parents did some last minute uh, packing back in the bedroom. So my brother and I were just gazing out the front window, just, you know, whiling the time away, and then suddenly we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway. They carried rifles with 
shiny bayonets on them. They stomped up the front porch and with their fists began pounding on the, uh, the door. I thought that the way I remembered it, the whole house shook with their pounding. It was a terrorizing sound. My fa father came out of the bedroom, answered the door, and literally at gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. My father gave my brother and me packages to carry. He hefted two heavy looking uh, suitcases and we followed him out and stood on the driveway waiting for our mother to come out. And when she finally came out, she had our baby sister in one arm, a huge duffel bag in the other, and tears were flowing down her cheeks. It was a morning I will never be able to erase from my memory. We were loaded onto trucks with other Japanese American families that had been gathered and uh, driven downtown to the uh, Buddhist temple in Little Tokyo. And there, there were rows of uh, buses and we were loaded onto the buses and driven out to Santa Anita Racetrack where we were unloaded and herded over to the stable area. And each family was assigned a horse stall, still pungent with the stink of horse manure, for my parents to take their children into that horse stall was a painful, degrading, humiliating experience. But I remember to five-year-old me, I thought it was fun to sleep where the horses sleep. <laughs> if you breathe deeply, you can smell the horses. <laughs> So, you know, my memories are that of a five-year-old kid. Yeah. And a lot of my real memories of the uh, imprisonment, uh, which was later to follow, the uh, yes. uh, racetrack was uh, uh, temporary while the camps were being, uh, being built. Yes. Um, but my real memories are that of a five-year-old kid. And it wasn't until... Uh, I was older that I began to understand it, but just the extent the, of the, the events were the same ev uh, events as that uh, that my parents experienced. So the, there's a two there's a parallel st uh, s a story that I tell in uh, to, uh, it, uh, uh, they called us enemy. I remember my childhood memories, but I also via that introduce uh, the reader to the larger harrowing experience of my parents, yes. to lose everything. Your father was a successful businessman. He owned a dry cleaning business. Right. And you had a two-story or two-bedroom home in Boyle Heights. Right? That's right. And their bank account was taken. Yes. We were literally was uh, stripped naked. And their freedom was taken. Put uh, eventually, uh, when the, uh, the uh, construction was finished, we were put on a train crowded into a, a, a train with uh, uh, armed soldiers at bo both ends of each car and transported two thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of Arkansas. And I, the, I remember the barbed wire fence that uh, confined us, the sentry towers with the machine guns pointed at us. I remember the searchlight that followed me when I ma made the night runs from our barrack to the latrine yeah but again to five-year-old me i thought it was nice that they lit the way for me to pee <laughs> i i find it so interesting that you talk so much about how five-year-old you took this experience in do you think to some extent experiencing it as a child saved you from some of the more damaging trauma that can result from an experience like I that? I think it was my parents. They shielded us. Yes, your father said you were on going on vacation when That's you were on right. the train. That's right. We were going on vacation. And for this Southern Californian kid to be plunked down in the middle of the swamps of southeastern Arkansas, the bayous uh, were right outside the uh, barbed wire fence and lots of trees there. I called it the jungle. And the magical thing is, these trees were growing out of water, and their roots snaked in and out of the wa water. 
I'd never seen a thing, uh, trees growing out of water. And part of the uh, edges of the bayou came into the camp. And uh, around the edges, I, I saw black wiggly fish swimming around. And they were so slow that I was able to scoop them up, catch them, and put them in a jar and uh, watch them uh, day after day. And one day, I'd, I'd see a little bump on their side. And the next morning, it was getting bigger. And they, they were starting to look like legs. And then my black wiggly fish with the legs lost their tail. And they escaped hopping out of my jar. <laughs> Fantastical place, yeah. this place called. Was there, um, do you remember a moment when it stopped being fun? Do you remember a moment when you realized or had at least some inkling of the terrible situation you were in? I didn't realize then, but thinking back, one night something made me wake up in the middle of the night and I saw my parents uh, on the other side uh, hovering over a, ker a kerosene lamp and they were carrying on a whispered conversation and my mother sounded like she was crying. So I said, Mama, don't cry. And my parents came over and said, uh, 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 I'm, I'm not crying. We were just having a discussion. Go back to sleep. I think back on that. And I, when I was a, a teenager, I, I had discussions with my father. And I think that was when they were discussing the loyalty questionnaire, the notorious loyalty questionnaire. It was. Well, let me go back. Uh, immediately after Pearl Harbor, young Japanese Americans, like all uh, young Americans, rushed to their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the U.S. military. Yes. This was an act of patriotism. Yes, and they were Americans. They were Americans. And uh, we were attacked, and they, as young Americans, they went with their friends to volunteer. That volunteer uh, pa uh, patriotic act was answered with a slap on the face. They were denied military service and categorized as enemy alien, which was crazy. I mean, that was a patriotic act, and to call them the enemy was crazy. And equally crazy was the second word, alien. They were born, educated, uh, reared, in the United States, they felt American, and yet they were called aliens, and then put into these barbed wire prison camps. But a year into imprisonment, the government realized they had a wartime manpower shortage, and here were all these people, young people that they could have had, that they, ca uh, they categorized as enemy alien. How to justify drafting them out of a barbed wire concentration camp. It was a dilemma the government had. Their solution was as crazy as the internment itself. A year into imprisonment, after they've stripped us of everything, uh, uh, all the property we have, they were demanding loyalty. It, uh, they came down with a loyalty question at which everyone in the, in the 10 camps had to respond to, everyone on, over the age of 17. There were about 30 questions, but two questions became notorious. They turned all 10 camps into turmoil and, and anger. Question 27 asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? This being asked of my mother, she had three children. My baby sister was a toddler by then. I was six years old. My brother was five. She was being asked to abandon her children and bear arms to defend the nation that's imprisoning her family. It was preposterous. Both my parents answered no to that question. The next question, question 28, was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, 
will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? We're Americans. As if you'd ever sworn we never loyalty had to the a loyalty. Emperor of Japan, right? And so if you answered no, I don't have a loyalty to the Emperor to forswear, that no applied to the first part of the very same sentence meant you won't swear your loyalty to the United States. If you wanted to answer yes to that, that yes applied to the second part, uh, will you forswear your loyalty to the uh, Emperor of Japan, that yes meant you were, you were confessing that you had a loyalty to the emperor and were now prepared to forswear right. that and re-pledge your loyalty right. to the United States. It was an insulting question for them to presume that we had a racial inborn loyalty to the emperor. My mother was born in Sacramento, California. My father was born in Japan, but uh, he lost his mother when he was still very uh, young and my widower gran uh, grandfather decided he's gonna start life anew in America. Yeah, so he came here as a little boy. He, he came to San Francisco with uh, his two sons. My father was the younger. And so my father was reared here, uh, educated here, went to college here. Uh, he was a San Franciscan. And so, uh, the, for, yes, my father was a San Franciscan. <laughs> that lone San Franciscan that <laughs> applauded. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my father lived more of his life in Los Angeles than in San Francisco. And so I said, Daddy, how come you keep calling yourself a San Franciscan when you've lived longer in Los Angeles? Yeah. He said, once a San Franciscan, <laughs> always a San Franciscan. <laughs> so George, even though you yourself, you were a child, you did not have to answer that questionnaire. <coughs> I wonder how much of your post internment experience, you have felt like you've had to prove your Americanness, especially after um, after you were released and your family went back to Los Angeles, you write about how you had a, a school teacher who would call you that Jap boy, and it really made you realize in many ways that you were not seen as American and to really feel it from other people's treatment of you. And so I often feel like there is an element of that for almost all Asian Americans to some extent to be seen as truly American. But I wonder how much that played a role in, in your career and as you pursued acting roles and accepted certain acting well, roles. Well, being freed from camp was as traumatic as uh, when the soldiers came to take us away. You'd think that, you know, being freed, we're, we're not behind yeah. barbed wire fence. You can go out but we were, we were impoverished. They took everything from us. And uh, 1946 is still immediately post-war. And the hostility, we came back to Los Angeles, but the hostility toward us was still intense. Jobs were difficult. Uh, housing was impossible. Our first home was on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. And for us kids, I was eight years old by that time, and my baby sister was now for she, she spent all her life, you know, mm. in uh, behind barbed wire fences. Uh, she was four. We came back to Los Angeles to Skid Row, and Skid Row, the chaos and the noise and the stink was was horrific. I mean, first of all, the um, scary, smelly, uh, ugly people staggering about or leaning against the. Uh, buildings or, or, or just sprawled on the sidewalk and, and uh, s some were fighting. Two women, I remember, were sh shrieking at each other and, and pulling each other's hair. We'd never seen anything like that. And the smell of human waste everywhere on the street, in the hallways, was unbearable. 
and the shrieking of uh, sirens day and night, the chaos, you know, and at night uh, uh, our skid row room would glow red with the uh, uh, light from the uh, police cars. It was a horrific place. And then you go to school and the teacher calls you the Jap boy, which stung. And I mean, she constantly called me that, so I, I never raised my hand. It was uh, just as traumatic as being uh, uh, rounded up for internment. So the internment was bookended by two unforgettable uh, traumas. Uh, but uh, as I grew older, I became very curious about my childhood imprisonment. And uh, so I started reading books, history books. I became a voracious reader. There was nothing about the internment in uh, the books. I read civics books. There was nothing about it. But then I read about the uh, noble ideals of our democracy. All men are created equal, equal justice under the law. Uh, this is a nation ruled by law. How come we were imprisoned if we had these ideals as uh, uh, part of our, our uh, system of uh, justice? The only person I could go to for uh, explanation on that was my father. And I was, you know, the um, civil rights movement was going there and I was impressed by uh, the, the speeches of, uh, made by Dr. Martin Luther King on the radio that I heard. And, and there they are, you know, uh, demanding justice and equality. And uh, it happened to us, but we weren't doing anything about it. And I said, Daddy, mm -hmm. I would have protested. I would have organized my friends at school and gone downtown and uh, uh, gone to the federal building and, and protested. And he said, yes, you, I can imagine you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, it was different for me. I had to think about your mother, you, your brother, and your sister. They were pointing guns at me. If something happened to me, what would happen to you guys? And I understood that. But I, I, I said, Daddy, that's still, I mean, the ideals of, of democracy. How come you didn't uh, uh, do anything about it? And, uh, and sometimes those uh, after dinner conversations got pretty heated. And I remember one heated conversation where I got really excited and, and, and I said something that uh, I still regret to this day. I said, Daddy, you led us like sheeps to slaughter into the internment camps. And suddenly the give and take of uh, the conversation stopped. There was a silence that seemed to go on. And finally my father looked at me and said, well, maybe you're right. And he got up and walked into his bedroom and closed the door. Immediately, I knew that I hit a nerve. I'd hurt him. And I felt terribly. This man that I'd loved and who had suffered so much during the internment. And years after that, his own son hurts him again, and I felt like going to, to his door and not, uh, knocking on his and apologizing, but it felt awkward. And so I thought, I'll uh, apologize tomorrow. And you never did, right? You never actually I never reconciled did, around that Because it was even more awkward in the morning, and I never did. It's and now I can't apologize. It's interesting you talk about this because one of the the motivations you've said for your book is that you've been shocked at how many or how few people know the internment experience or know that it even is a chapter in American history or, or know it well enough to understand what it really was. Um, and part of that is the shame associated with it, the fact that families didn't talk about it. But interestingly, right. it sounded like your father was willing to speak with you about the experience and to speak with you about um, about democracy and America's ideals. Though you do recount this really in 
an interesting story when you were working on the campaign of Adlai Stevenson and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was going to visit the campaign that day. And it was one moment where you saw that, uh, one moment where you're, it did become too much for your father. Well, I feel I was blessed by having an extraordinary man for, for a father. Um, you said there are many Japanese Americans that know very little about the internment experience. Or even just Because Americans their parents generally. didn't talk about it. Yes. Uh, uh, for, for understandable reasons. You know, they were hurt, and uh, they didn't want to inflict their children with their hurt and the s sense of uh, degradation and the shame that they felt. The shame wasn't theirs. It, it, the shame was really the government's, and yet they took on that shame and they didn't uh, talk about it with their parents, uh, with their children. And so, so many Japanese Americans, especially when we were doing uh, Allegiance on Broadway, uh, they would come backstage to tell us how moved they were by this, uh, the drama that we uh, uh, tell on stage. And they, they'd tell me that their parents or their grandparents were in camp. So I'd, uh, I'd ask them, oh, which camp were, you, were they in? The faces of blank. I, uh, I, well, I thought I'd help them out by saying, well, were they in Wyoming, Arkansas, Arizona, I, I, Idaho? Yeah. They don't know. So I realize how, uh, how blessed I, I was to have my father. And we got to talking about uh, our go uh, government. And I learned about our government and, how, uh, and, it's, uh, and what, what it stands for from my father, who was so abused and so uh, robbed of, of so much of his, you know, that chunk of his life, uh, not only the property, but his sense of who he was. And he was able to tell me that our democracy is a people's democracy, and it's dependent on people who cherish those ideals that we talk about, and and actually make it happen. That uh, makes it a, a, a good system. Well, and that's how I got. Uh, I, I kept saying, "But daddy, but daddy," you know, and my father said. Let me show you how it has to happen. And one Sunday afternoon, he drove me downtown to the Adlai Stevenson for President campaign headquarters. He said, this is a participatory democracy, and we have to participate in order to keep it true to what its ideals are. And so, so we've I learned about our democracy from my father, yes. who was so uh, humiliated, robbed of so much of his life, and was still able to tell me that our democracy is made up of people who can do great things, but who are also fallible human beings. And so our democracy is dependent on people who cherish those ideals and actively participate, sometimes holding democracy's feet to the fire to make it a true democracy. Which is very much something that you model. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience around certain themes, and, and I'd love to put some of these questions to you, uh, particularly about your decision to come out. This question is, at what point in your life did you come out to yourself? Was it harder for you due to your cultural background? And this is from Jennifer Massey. And someone else asks, what advice would you give someone who's still not out to their family? And what words of wisdom or advice do you have for this cur current generation of LGBTQ? Well, um, I think I was about eight or nine when I began to realize that I'm a little bit different in ways other than just my Japanese face. These um, the other boys would say things like, Sally's cute. 
Well, I thought Sally was nice. <laughs> 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 or there was uh, another, uh, this was in junior high school, a girl named Monica, who was prematurely blossoming out in full womanhood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other boys would say, wow, Monica's hot. <laughs> I thought Monica was nice too, but you know, <laughs> not, nothing to get that excited about. <laughs> But what got me excited was Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I found that I was different from the other boys. And I didn't want to be different because we were in prison because we were different. Oh. And it's all connected. I wanted to be as normal as yeah. possible. And so, uh, when my buddy uh, said, Monica's hot, I said, oh yeah, she's hot. I didn't mean it, but I was just a acting to, you know, be one of the guys. And when they started to date, I dated. And when my buddy wanted to uh, double date, we double dated. But to tell the truth, I was more interested in my buddy than in my date. <laughs> So, you know, there's that period when you're uh, a teenager that yeah. you really want to be with, uh, be like everybody else. And eventually you had a career to protect as exactly. well. And I, you, you know, uh, when I was a teenager, there was a movie star that I was really smitten with. How many of you here remember the name Tab Hunter? <laughs> He was blonde, good-looking, and a wonderful matinee idol. Mm. Every movie that came from uh, uh, Warner Brothers Studio starred Tab Hunter. And I later discovered that he went to the same junior high school that I went to, Mount Vernon Junior High. Uh, I read in one of the fan magazines that he went there. And so I uh, went to the library, looked up uh, the uh, past uh, yearbooks, and there he was. His name wasn't Tab Hunter then. It was Art Galeen. <laughs> Art Were you Galeen. ever attracted to Asian American men or did you find that you tended to be attracted to white guys? I wanted to be like everybody else and everybody else wasn't Asian. <laughs> you know, um, I lived in a, uh, by, by the time I was a teenager, my parents bought a home in the uh, yes. Wilshire district and uh, it was a mi uh, mixed uh, 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 neighborhood, mostly white, uh, largely Jewish, a uh, few African-American professionals, doctors and lawyers, and uh, we were about the only Asian family there. So, uh, you know. Just sort of what was around you, but also do you think you sort of internalize some standards of beauty in, in our culture. Exactly. Drew you Tab down. Hunter was the... Yeah, <laughs> he was sort of the epitome of all of that. Well, what but, advice but, would you give to somebody but, who isn't out yet? Let me tell you, you about Tab Hunter, though. Oh, okay, you really want to talk about <laughs> I saw every one of his pictures, you know, <laughs> Damn Yankees, <laughs> Battle Cry, but one of the scandal sheets, exposed him as being gay mm. and suddenly no tab hunter he just disappeared mm. and that was a lesson to me you can't be an actor and have a career if you're known as gay and by that time i was starting to understand the word gay and it applied to everything i felt tab hunter Bobby, you know, cute boys, uh, the football hero on the football team, the quarterback, you know. And so I was understanding a little bit more about me. I am different, not just my face, but my orientation. But I loved acting, and my career was going fairly well. 
And so I had that to protect. So all these forces that uh, kept me closeted. But I discovered that I wasn't the only one who felt like I did. I met other guys who liked other guys. And I was introduced to gay bars. In those days, they were all in the sleazy neighborhoods. And you entered from the alley. There was a little red light, and you walked in. I, I, it was a grungy you know, kind, kind of area. And suddenly, there's the, all this beautiful guys and some fat guys. <laughs> <laughs> But they were friendly and warm and, you know, uh, pool tables. And, and so I felt I wasn't so alone. There are other people like me. And I was able to put down my guard because I was acting like the other guys. And there I wasn't, I didn't have to. And so I was making, you know, th this discovery. But then... Um, and by that time, I had a career going. I had Star Trek. Yes. Uh, but then I heard that there was a, um, a big incident in New York City, in Greenwich Village. A bar called the Stonewall Inn was raided. And, uh, and I'd, I'd learned that they raided uh, gay bars in Los Angeles, too. And so we have to be careful, you know, be, uh, know where the exits are so you can slip out. And there in, uh, in 1969, summer of 69, exactly 50 years from this year, mm -hmm. uh, Stonewall Inn was uh, raided. And the people at that bar then decided they didn't want to be uh, harassed like this and they were going to retaliate. And uh, there were a lot of uh, what were called drag queens there at that bar. And when the police came in, they started throwing th things at them, beer bottles, ashtrays, whatever that was handy. And it was so intense. Some of those uh, drag queens taught, uh, stood firm on their high heel shoes and started flinging like yeah. baseball pitchers, you know. And it was so intense that the p uh, police had to uh, withdraw. And you yourself very much had a moment where you weren't going to take it anymore when, when then Governor Schwarzenegger refused to sign the That was policy. much, much later than yeah. that. But it took it that long for you to century. come out, right, to publicly. What I, I mean, you've described, you've described the experience of being closeted as another form of, of imprisonment of barbed wire. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, uh, it was uh, legal barbed wire fences with sharp, discriminatory uh, barbs on them. We were, you know, uh, imprisoned in the, by law uh, into uh, just gay bars and psychologically feeling that we are uh, outliers. Uh, but in, um, I'd found, I had some re relationships, but I'd, uh, by the 80s, I found someone, uh, I joined a, a gay running club called the LA Front Runners. And, oh, there are front runners here too. Yeah, I've run with the San Francisco front, uh, front runners too in my <laughs> running days. Um, and uh, uh, the um, best runner in the club was this lean, tight muscled uh, <laughs> guy named Brad. <laughs> He was the best runner in the club, and I heard that he had run a couple of marathon marathons. I'd never wow. done any. <laughs> so I went up to him and said, uh, can you train me for my first marathon? Were you really interested in running a marathon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you end up doing a marathon? <laughs> I did one. Oh, you did. <laughs> Particularly trained by Brad. You had to keep it going. You had to keep it going. <laughs> and things happened <laughs> during the course of uh, the training. And I did my first marathon, and I finished it. Wow. Brad came in more than an hour <laughs> ahead of me. <laughs>
He's right here. <laughs> Brad, Brad Takei, Brad Takei. Well, this question from a listener says, please describe each of your Star Trek co-stars with one word. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start. Walter Koenig. Walter, uh, just one word. One word. One word. Um, friend. Nishal Nichols. Darling. William Shatner. <laughs> Ego. <laughs> James Duhon. I hope I'm saying that right. Great drinking buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he squeezed it in. DeForest Kelly. Gentleman. Leonard Nimoy. Conscience. Hmm. <laughs> There's, let's, let's stick with this one or two word answer thing. Who was your inspiration growing up? Who was my inspiration growing up? Yes. I would say, you know, in retrospect, the um, most profound uh, influencer for me was my father. That makes sense. What advice would you give to activists who are fighting for civil rights and are overwhelmed with how big the fight uh, we're in and how little a difference it feels like one person can make? Every individual can make a difference. We, you know, I mean, what's going on right now seems overwhelming politically, but every vote counts. Vo uh, voters are... <laughs> that guy that's living in the White House <laughs> would not be uh, the president. In, uh, we, I, we were Hillary supporters, but we know people that said, I don't like Hillary for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And they said, I'm not going to vote. They are the ones that help that guy get elected. <laughs> Every vote counts. For example, George Bush, because of the closeness of the vote in Florida, it got thrown into the Supreme Court. That's how people that didn't vote uh, in the uh, Bush-Gore race uh, helped elect George Bush. Every vote counts, and by your not voting, you have helped the person that you uh, didn't want in office get into office. Every vote counts, and they say, you know, I'm just one vote, but you know, Dr. King was one person. We all have the gift of influencing others. And Dr. King was a major one vote, one voice that multiplied because he was so uh, uh, eloquent and so moving. And he uh, committed himself, body and soul, to the cause. Every vote counts. And that's why the book, uh, this, uh, they called us enemy. Uh, that story of my childhood imprisonment, I wrote about in my uh, autobiography, which was published in 1994, called To the Stars. It's the same story. But with uh, They Called Us Enemy, I chose to do it as a graphic memoir or uh, comic strips, uh, targeting the young uh, reader, teenagers, young adults, because I wanted, you know, I, I was a, a comic book reader when I was a kid. I loved comic books. And when you're a teenager, you know, you absorb in everything that you read into, through your pores, and it stays with you. And so I thought we need to reach people in their teenage years when they're absorbing in information because, uh, to this day, I can share my childhood uh, imprisonment with someone I, could, I consider well-read, well-informed, and they're shocked 
that something like that happened because they never knew about the internment of uh, innocent people simply because of our race. And so I want to reach young people who are the voters of tomorrow. And once they know uh, uh, the history of uh, uh, the fallibility of a people's government, uh, they will not be non-voters. They will be voters. And they will prevent the kind of thing that's happening now on the southern borders, which is a new low. I mean, we were always together with our parents. You mean parents. in terms of separating parents That's from right. their children at the southern border. And you have talked about the parallel of, of parents and children being separated even during internment when they would take the father or mother away for questioning and it was unclear when they would ever see their parents But it again. wasn't like what's happening now. Um, uh, yes. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, the FBI swooped down on Japanese American uh, families and uh, took people that they considered leaders of the community. The so-called leaders were Japanese language teachers, Buddhist ministers, martial arts instructors. Right. They weren't anyone uh, doing subversive work, but because they uh, were teaching something to do with Japanese uh, culture or martial arts, they were swooped up. And, and so uh, many families uh, went into internment without the father. Well, this question is from an audience member who writes, do you think America will ever recover from this presidency? Can we return to a, quote, normal? We will, and today's news is already evidence of it. He will be impeached. You talked a little bit about voting as an act of a, an act that can that an individual can do that can have an impact. There was one thing that I was really struck by in your description of your experience as a child. You talk a lot about your dad, and rightly so. But one of the things that you really highlight is that your mother snuck a sewing machine among her possessions that she could carry when she was removed from her home. And Which was forbidden. And it was forbidden. Anything mechanical, anything with sharp edge edges or points right. were forbidden. What, what, what did that mean? What did that tell you about your mom? Because there's clearly something about that that you connect with in your mother. My mother was a tough lady. She, um, everything was taken from us. We could only take what we, uh, we could carry. My father's car uh, would have been abandoned except for a neighbor who offered $5. So my father sold our car, a Pontiac, for $5. There were some families uh, that had uh, rare Japanese uh, chinaware, and the neighbor came and offered a dollar for them. And I, I remember uh, hearing my mother uh, tell us about that lady who took those plates right in front of that lady that offered a dollar and slammed them on the floor right in front of her. She was so angry. It's, it's these acts of resistance. It felt like that the sewing machine was your mom's act of resistance. It was a brand new uh, portable sewing machine. <laughs> it was heavy. That duffel bag she was carrying had the sewing machine in it. It was wrapped in blanket, baby blankets, and sweaters. And then on top, she had uh, boxes of animal cookies and uh, uh, Cracker Jack and a uh, storybook for uh, uh, us to uh, have read by, by our father. It was a heavy uh, duffel bag. And she wouldn't let anyone, not even my father, carry that. She marched right past those armed MPs military police. I mean, that was a gutsy thing to do. Yeah, but it was. She, she walked right past them, and uh, all uh, through um, the uh, uh, Santa Anita racetrack uh, uh, housing for uh, however many months, four months, uh, she uh, never opened that. Uh, and she uh, carried it in, uh, onto the train and all the way to Arkansas. 
And then once we got into our barrack, she revealed to my father and us. Uh, and they started, my father started laughing <laughs> and, and crying at the same time. Yeah. And uh, we, we didn't understand, you know, I mean, we, uh, we thought there'd be more Cracker Jack. Uh, <laughs> 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 Pretty disappointed, huh? It was the biggest and heaviest disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they were both laughing and crying, and we laughed along, I, I remember, but we had no idea why we were laughing. We were just joining in. Yeah. It, later on now, I understand that what there that was a little uh, bitterness in those tears yes. as well. But she was a gutsy lady, and she exhibited that kind of determination. She also hated the fact that she couldn't cook for us. That was another th thing that was taken away from her. We all had to eat in that mass mess hall, lining up three times a day and eating lousy food in a noisy mess hall. Yes. But that was part of the routine of incarceration. So this question is Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group in America. How do you feel about the group's representation in politics and media? And I would take it a step further actually and, and talk about, I mean, even just this year, <coughs> we are seeing Asian American actors stand up for their identity to be able to tell their own stories and control how they're told. It's very hard, especially when you were coming up as an actor, you were subject to whomever had the resources and the power, um, however they saw Asians and wanted them represented, you had to basically portray that to get work. When we talk about for the first time in 25 years, like since the Joy Luck Club, we had a movie with an all Asian cast, how much progress have we really made, do you feel like? Progress is slow, but it is, we are advancing forward. And we are now the producers and the writers and the directors behind these projects. Uh, 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 Crazy Rich Asians or Farewell. Joy Luck Club was, uh, was how many decades ago. Uh, we are making progress. As a matter of fact, uh, I, together with uh, three other partners, we have the um, uh, film rights to a, a best-selling novel. It was a bestseller about uh, nine, ten years ago. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the book, uh, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. It's a, uh, ah, some of you know the book, by Jamie Ford, who's a Chinese-American, uh, half. Uh, He's a Ford, but he's, uh, his <laughs> other half is Chinese. Yeah. And <laughs> Let it go. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's about a uh, young Chinese man and a Japanese American woman uh, before Pearl Harbor. They uh, are um, students at a very exclusive uh, white high school um, on a scholarship and they have to work, and they, they work in the cafeteria, and they fa uh, fall in love. And then Pearl Harbor ha happens, and the girl is taken away. But he loves her so much that he, uh, and this uh, story takes place in Seattle. He uh, goes to the internment camp in uh, uh, Idaho, where uh, she's incarcerated, and because he's Asian, He's able to sneak in and mingle with the, the uh, incarcerated Japanese Americans, but eventually she's found out. And uh, it uh, is a story, a uh, poignant, very poignant love story. He marries a, a Chinese American woman and he has uh, a son. It, it's two father son relationships as well. Uh, the boy's uh, immigrant. Chinese immigrant father and their relationship, the, the big cultural uh, difference there. And he is um, uh, always sending money to China because Japan is uh, 
uh, invading China, and he's uh, supporting uh, the uh, 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 Chinese cause. And so here he is in love with a Japanese-American girl that's in a prison camp in uh, the uh, U.S., and his father is a passionate supporter of uh, the Chinese fighting uh, Japanese aggression in China. Uh, and then he has a son of his own, and uh, he falls in love with a Caucasian uh, girl. And uh, so there's uh, his adjustment to uh, his son's uh, 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 values, but also the love between his father and his, his, his love for his son is there. It's a beautiful uh, relationship story. Uh, his love for the uh, uh, Japanese girl, Japanese American girl, but also his love for his father, as well as his love for his son, and uh, his son being uh, a contemporary uh, techie, uh, helps him find his true love. Uh, and there's a poignant ending to the book. And th uh, those of you that read the book, uh, I think you'll agree it's a very filmic story as well. Yes. It lends itself to... Uh, uh, so there's a lot of dimension and a lot of... It, it, it touches on and alludes to a lot of things about the Asian American experience. Right. And raises the awareness of... Uh, the internment story as well. Raises the awareness And of that's the one of my story. missions in life. Yes. We are out of time, but I, I do want to ask this question, and I just want to congratulate this audience. These are some of the most amazing <laughs> questions I've ever received, and I wish I could ask him all of these. Um, and a very responsive audience, too. Yes. yes I love San Francisco audiences. <laughs> And this person asks, they write, internment and family separation have been shown to cause immeasurable and lasting trauma in children. And what would your advice be to these children drawing from your own experiences? I can tell based on how much you, you tweet or post about the family separations that are happening at the border and that are still happening despite the, um, the order from the judge, that this is something that affects you deeply. It is horrific, and it's a grotesque new low that we're uh, seeing on the southern border. If, if you could say something to the children, what would you say? Well, you know, it's a different kind of horror that they're going through, because we were always together with our parents. My father especially was a pillar of strength. Uh, and my mother was a tough lady too. Yes. And, and they shielded us, us from a lot of the horrors of, uh, of the camp. Uh, and there were some horrific moments. Uh, there was a riot, I remember, yes. and the terror of that. These children are torn away from their parents. I think they uh, will be profoundly shaped and formed by that experience in a negative way. I'd like to be an optimist, but you know, they have no one to shield them from the horrific uh, reality that they're going through. And to really underscore the evil of this administration, some of the children are scattered in the outer reaches of the United States from the southern border. Places like um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, New Jersey, deliberately to, to uh, tear them away from any kind of connection with uh, where they came from, the culture and the people that they came from. And when the uh, courts order them to bring them together, this administration is so incompetent that they can't find the children or the, the, the parents might have been deported already and so they're, they're never gonna get together. And, and, and yet you're still optimistic about America about America's future? On a larger scale. Um, I mean, these four children's lives, I think, are, are profoundly uh, gonna be shaped by this uh, without their parents. Uh, but when we were incarcerated, to illustrate the progress that we've made, when we were incarcerated, every elected official, in fact, the whole country uh, 
was swept up by war hysteria. All the uh, politicians from city council to the presidency uh, were Earl vilifying Warren. us. Errol Warren, only one uh, major elected official, the governor of Colorado, Ralph Carr, stood up and said, this is wrong. This is uh, uh, unconstitutional. And for that principled stand, his political career was destroyed. There were uh, individuals like uh, Harold Nicholson, who had uh, a bookstore in Pasadena, uh, a Roman's bookstore. And he uh, was committed to uh, helping uh, Japanese Americans as much as possible. He uh, brought, uh, drove out to Manzanar, which is a good three, four hour drive from Pasadena, and he donated those books. And he came every month on an appointed date. On one of those drives, he was shot at by rednecks. Bullets uh, uh, pierced his car. But he got to a Manzanar and uh, donated the books. But the people of, at my, uh, Manzanar said, this is it. He's not going to come back again. The next month, at the appointed time, he still came back with the books. Uh, an, Harold Nicholson. Again, San Francisco, the much vaunted American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, the great uh, liberal uh, progressive organization, as a national organization, stayed neutral during the Second World War on the issue of uh, the internment of Japanese Americans. Only one chapter, the San Francisco chapter, stood up and said, this is wrong. And the attorney, who's one of my, my personal heroes, said, I am going to, uh, no attorney will, would touch any Japanese American uh, case. He said, I am going to fight for Japanese American rights. And the uh, three uh, Supreme Court uh, challenges uh, to the uh, internment, uh, Gordon Hirabashi, Min uh, uh, Yasui and Fred Korematsu challenged the internment, and they were represented by Wayne Collins, the San Francisco attorney. <laughs> but these people were uh, uh, extraordinary. Uh, all of America were fiercely opposed to Japanese Americans, but when uh, Trump got into office and his first executive order was the uh, Muslim travel ban, when that executive order was signed, the next night, thousands of Americans throughout the country rushed to the airports to protest uh, the uh, Muslim travel ban. Yes, let's applaud that. And attorneys rushed to the airports to offer pro bono service to uh, 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 foreign, foreigners coming into the country. And the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Sally Yates, said she will not defend this uh, 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 executive order. So we have pro progressed. Okay. I mean, it takes a long time, but this will never happen again, I'm, I'm confident because of the way the country is de uh, developing. The, the, uh, the ugly phenomenon of uh, this orangutan getting into the <laughs> presidency. <laughs> is the last time this is gonna ha happen because I think there will be more Americans now uh, educated to the importance of their vote. The, well, every vote counts and they will uh, act on it and will prevent any kind of uh, 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 candidacy like uh, this man. Well, it's, it's heartening to hear you say that, that you don't believe it will happen again, at least the exp and, or at least that there will be far more people who will stand up if it is. It is happening. We are making progress. Uh, if you compare what happened in 1942, to uh, what happened in uh, 2016, 
I think there's a night and day difference. But, you know, it's always like four steps forward, three steps back. Another four step forward, one step back. Uh, that's the um, uh, progression the of civilization. We are making progress. I, you know, and I'm optimistic because it's the optimists that get things done. The pessimists say it's, it's overwhelming. It's too, uh, it's too much. Uh, it can't be done. Optimism is what gets us moving forward. George Takei.